modernist approach. What the Venice Biennale actually did is talked about a showcase. And ironically, they modelled it on the trade fair uh, concept, which was very, very big in terms of industry back in the 19th century. So places like the Crystal Palace. Even Rodin ended up adopting that kind of entrepreneurial approach when he was presenting his work at those times. Um, so this, this, this event, the Venice Biennale, happened fortuitously as an anniversary gift to um, King Alberto and the big Queen Margarita of Savoy <coughs> uh, as a kind of a gesture for their wedding anniversary, something the Venice um, municipality put on for them. It, um, it was really interesting because, again, this aligns with this concept of, of the merchant class. Uh, I mean, I'm, it's quite ironic that I'm now living in Singapore, which is kind of like the logistics capital of the world. But going back in time, that's the role that Venice played, being on the spice route and being at that kind of junction where many cultures came together <coughs> and gave them an opportunity to rethink who they were, to actually be eclectic <coughs> in, that, um, in that architectural setting that they were presented. And in a way, it's kind of very much like the arts. It's, 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 it's almost a charade. It's, it's almost a veneer. I mean, Venice is, is a floating island. I mean, its stability is really with what it's brought in from outside, not with what it starts off with which is the antithesis to Australia, if we're thinking about that as another filter. You know, here we are, a, a land mass that is so rich in resources. Um, places like Venice and Singapore are the opposite. They have to invest in, in innovation uh, and their people to really make a difference. So the idea of the art market being part of this initial concept of setting up the Biennale is, is really important. And what they wanted to do was they wanted to measure their success. Number of artists, number of sales, number of countries that were coming in. And of course this has all been recorded over many, many years. Um, and it's wonderful to look at the statistics that come from the Biennale. So that we get a sense of how many people from all over Europe and nowadays with, with contemporary transportation opportunities all over the world will come to the Venice Biennale. When I had opportunities, I used to do the Vernissage, which is the two-day preview before the um, Biennale happened. Well, you know, one year there were 6,000 journalists. We were all just fighting to get in to get our stories filed before the Biennale started. Um, and, you know, 6,000 journalists can make a hell of a mess in terms of looking at art and getting the ideas and trying to find the best pieces. And it, and it was a little bit, I suppose, like it must have been on the gold diggings, trying to find the best place to set up camp and actually get, the, get your photographer to photograph that particular installation and so that you had enough context to write it up and get it back to your editor. But it was, a, it was an absolute um, sort of dynamic event. And this is exactly what the Biennale continues to do. Biennale has actually been running consistently since um, 1895, except during the Second World War, leading up to the Second World War, um, when uh, Mussolini uh, banned foreign artists from coming into to the Biennale. Um, and again, that's a very interesting area. So, um, of course, in the 1930s Biennale, you will see that it is very much um, about futurism work that Navanetti was doing. So again, it kind of shapes very much where Italy was on at that particular time. We weren't part of the Biennale then, although an Italian artist, um, uh, uh, Dante Rovero, um, who came to Australia in 1907, went home to visit uh, his family and went to the Biennale uh, and said, this is a place that Australia should be. And he actually, we've got that in the archive in, um, in Sydney, the first reference of saying Australia should be represented at this place. Back in um, 1924, we were officially invited, but we weren't in a position to send our work there. It was just too difficult for logistics. But this very small um, document actually talks about who's represented at the Biennale. And you can sort of see this a there's a strong contingent that have been representing all the way through. But Australia actually comes in here 
in um, 1954 um, for the first time. And, uh, and then we've got an ongoing presence there um, for a couple of years and then we stopped and then we started again. Um, and you'll see that there's been some interruptions in other um, nations as well. But those interruptions actually are just as important as the participation because we actually start to see what's happening politically and socially, why artists aren't uh, being represented in the Biennale. Um, in 2011, the last Biennale that I attended, um, it was the largest and most inclusive Biennale uh, with 86 nations attending. This is very important because it's, it's no longer saying that the contemporary arts are just for Western nations. This, this gives everybody a voice. And when you go and look at the work, and often there are artists who you don't know, this is one of the other great things, that you can go in there and get a fresh experience of, of, of art practice. And then if you can get some sense of the context of where these artists have come from, whether they're from you know, Rwanda or Zimbabwe or somewhere like that, you know about their political contexts as well. Uh, and this really does give us a, an insight into many more things you know, greater than just aesthetics and techniques. Australia, as I said, has a proud history um, of over 60 years, but there are some interruptions. Um, after the 58 exhibition, um, there was a 20 year hiatus. Uh, and that was largely because of um, Robert Menzies, uh, who was the Arts Minister um, in that particular uh, uh, political regime. Um, and it's interesting that 78 is, um, is actually partly to do with the Australian Council, because the Venice Biennale only represents artists that are acknowledged by national authorities. So you can't just exhibit at the Venice Biennale because you'd like to. It, it's done by national invitation. Um, we also missed 84 again, and this is largely because of our P problem, the pavilions, uh, which I'll talk about in a moment. And some of you might have noticed in the Australia Today or the Age, um, there is talk of the new pavilion that um, Dean Corbin Marshall are um, designing for the 2015 Biennale. But basically from uh, Iman Stiller's onward, we've had consistent representation. And what this does is it really gives us this wonderful view of what Australia thought about itself, what it thought about big, big issues. You know, look at the, the inclusion of Indigenous names. Look at the balance of, you know, males back up here and then we get Rosalie and then all of a sudden we start to see gender balance coming through. We start to move away from painting into installation work and through here, a little bit of early video with Ken Armsworth, um, moving through into um, photography, um, videography, um, sculptural pieces which were outsourced by Patricia Piccinini, uh, and a whole range of new mediums that are being uh, used here to represent our um, you know, our contemporary art. This, this was actually the, uh, the letter. It was one of the great privileges, I suppose, about doing a PhD, and I know some of you doing PhDs here, but um, being able to find a project that you can just immerse yourself into. I mean, it's an indulgence, and um, you obviously need to have a supportive wife and people supporting bosses and all of those things to do this, but um, being able to go through the archives in Venice and to pick out letters that were written in 1924 inviting Australia here, to pick out an, an ink fountain pen written letter by Sidney Nolan talking to the commissioner about could he please post his lens cap back from his camera because he left it on his desk when he was having a cup of coffee discussing the UNESCO prize. And these sorts of beautiful things that allow you to really get underneath the art world, to actually start to feel something about what it is to be an artist, not just about the paintings and the sculptures and those things, but what it is to live the life of somebody in the art world. So this is really our first representation and um, 
This was, of course, the Menzies' cabinet. Menzies assumed the role of Minister for the Arts, simply because he was a great art collector. Uh, beautiful works in his collection. Um, but he kept rejecting the opportunities to go to Venice. We were invited many times, and people like Bernard Smith, um, you know, talked about it in 1952, you know, why aren't we at the Venice Biennale? We are a mature, um, you know, country now. We, we have the ability to send work there. And gradually, contemporary artists raised hell and said to Menzies, look, we've got to represent ourselves. If we're a significant country in the world, we need to present. I remember showing this to Bernard one day. He said, I completely forgot my rope hat. Um, which was, was really interesting. Even these snapshots of um, Rialto, every year they've, they've had a new banner that goes across the, um, uh, the bridge that talks about the, um, the Biennale. Uh, great insights into that particular history. Because Australia was invited into the Biennale fairly late, we hadn't built a pavilion or a space to actually represent our work. So we shared the central pavilion um, and we had um, room 34 uh, in the first time. We were surrounded by many other countries that were presented in there. And eventually in 58, we were given the porch area, which was a, a fenced in section through here, um, with uh, Ken Unsworth, um, uh, John Davis, um, and uh, sorry, Robert Owen and then John Davis in that section there. Um, but the first few exhibitions were actually fairly contemporary works from Australia. So um, Drysdale, um, Dobell, and Sid Nolan uh, had some work in Europe um, at the British Council, and we moved some of those pieces into um, Venice to actually get our first representation um, in 54. Now it's interesting because um, this is contemporaneous, and this is the French pavilion. And you can see that there is a sense of very modern work being presented there as well. Um, in 56, Albert Tucker was in Europe and he presented a few uh, works in an independent show. But then in 59, Robert Menzies decided that this was a great opportunity to really show how good Australia was in the arts. And this is what we show. <laughs> Poor old Arthur Street had been dead for 30 years. This was exhibited when Jackson Pollock's work was in the next room. And one of the attendants said to one of the um, Australian commissioners who came in to see the exhibition, they said, if you like this sort of work, you'll probably like what the Poles are doing as well, because they had very traditional uh, sort of uh, work that really belonged to the 19th century. Menzies, in terms of to acquiesce to the contemporary, uh, also suggested that um, we could take one fairly, well, we could take a live one with us. So he said that Arthur Boyd could go as well. And um, Arthur Boyd, it was interesting, was only allowed to show his landscape works, whereas at exactly that moment, in 1958, he was working on his Morning Bride and the, um, uh, the, the, the Bride and Stockman series, which was all about racial disharmony, I suppose, in Australia. But of course, Menzies censored that out quite deliberately um, so that we weren't seen to be um, controversial in any way. Now what this ended up doing was uh, created such a furor amongst contemporary artists and of course this is the time of the Antipodean Manifesto, all of those sorts of really edgy things were happening in Australia. Um, Alan McCulloch just, just laid it on the line and said look you know why are we presenting old-fashioned work in a contemporary exhibition? Menzies said all right if they're not happy with what I'm sending we just won't do it anymore. So 20 years we stopped representing ourselves in Venice. Until um, 78, 
And again, this was product of the Whitlam government setting up the Australia Council and taking out of government hands. It was still a government agency. Um, but uh, it, it was really interesting because one of my, my master's supervisor, um, a guy called Robert Owen, was um, uh, actually called up and said, you know, we need three people to represent ourselves in Venice. Um, the whole show is going to be about naturalism and contemporary art. Can you pack your bag and go? And he was virtually, that was the selection process. The other one was John Davis. Um, John Davis's work has become iconic, uh, I think, in terms of the, um, uh, the kind of the natural fibre works. He kind of hybridised between contemporary sculpture, which was largely about plastics and acrylics at the time, and reverted back to the tracker art concept, and created these wonderful installations which have become iconic artworks. Um, this is Robert Owen's work. Robert Owen actually worked a little bit with Joseph Boyes when he was in, in London in the early 70s. And Ken Unsworth's uh, work has become quite iconic too. So we're actually looking at great selections of work in 78. Um, this is where it was exhibited in the porch. Um, the next um, exhibition was in 80 with um, Kevin Mortison, who um, was arrested for being naked in the Biennale. Um, Mike Parr, Mike Parr's a significant uh, Australian artist today, highly conceptual. Um, and Tony, Tony Colling, who's just a naughty boy, I think um, Tony did everything to be mischievous. Um, this is, of course, one of his great works called um, uh, An Australian Native Plantation with um, Jackie Jackies and Jill Jill um, uh, Aboriginal gnomes out in front of the porch. He also um, picked up on Doug Anthony and Malcolm Fraser's um, yellow cake um, debacle, I suppose, with, with selling uranium uh, to France back in 78. And he was also naughty enough to set up a vending stand where he was selling um, or giving away Vegemite sandwiches. This is before um, Men at Work did their, you know, their, their great, great song. And he was also... Um, banned for selling food which wasn't sanctioned by the vendors. <laughs> so we had enormous controversy in, in 80. Then of course we had Peter Booth, um, famous, famous artist, and that wonderful suite of very rich paintings that Peter Booth produced in the, um, the, the early 80s was all, all shown at Venice. This was in a temporary pavilion. And in fact, there was a bomb blast in Venice and actually it blew some of the works off the wall. Now, these are priceless works nowadays. I mean, these, these are some of the great works of Australian art. Uh, and Rosalie Gascon is the other one um, who exhibited. Rosalie started making art um, in her late 50s and um, absolutely wonderful correspondence. I was able to go through all of her correspondence um, after she passed away. Um, Martin Gaskin, his son, um, was able to pull out all the letters about how she um, burst an eardrum on the plane going over there, how there was a fiasco and the venues weren't right, and all of these things. But Rosa Gaskin, again, um, particularly these sorts of installations, have, have become absolute standouts of the art of the 1980s. Um, 84 we didn't exhibit, there was no space for Australia. 86 we moved into the Arsenale. And Imran's Tillis, who was at the height of his work, um, working on uh, reproductions of contemporary artworks on his small panels, were shown. Um, and in fact, a number of the German artists, because we also had um, uh, Basilet and Kiefer, um, those artists were also exhibiting. And they were astounded to see that their work was being appropriated by this Australian Latvian artist at that particular time. Finally, we in um, 1998 stood up and said we will now purchase um, a, a, a pavilion. And um, the Hawke Keating government um, found some funding, um, but the, the space in Venice was only available if they can set up this pavilion in one year. Phillips Cox, uh, who was the head of the Design Council, was able to 
cobbled together and designed very quickly. And um, four weeks before the Venice Biennale started, um, where they were going to show the work of Arthur Boyd, they sent over a prefabricated pavilion that was designed by Cox, using a lot of the um, technology that had been used in the Darwin Harbour project that he worked on. Unfortunately, one of the pallets disappeared. Um, they had bad weather, um, and ultimately, the pavilion wasn't ready for the opening of the Biennale. It didn't have any windows in it. Um, we actually had Arthur Boyd's priceless um, encaustic works sitting in Venice in humidity with no windows, flapping on the wall, waiting for um, the opening, and, uh, and then of course the works were covered in plastic and uh, put into a storeroom where insect infestation um, colonised some of the encaustic paintings. Um, Marvellous stories again. The, uh, the, the Commissioner Grassi again wrote many of these in her diary, and um, I was able to find all of her diaries because they had been um, stored at the State Library um, after the Aita files had been um, taken away from the Australian Council. There's lots of stories within stories. So poor old Arthur Boyd was um, criticised when he exhibited in uh, '58. And then, of course, his work wasn't really even shown in um, 88. But eventually the building was completed, the windows were put in, the air conditioning was set up, and I think we actually made our final really big, bold statement as a nation by representing Indigenous people uh, in the Biennale. The work of Rover Thomas was exceptional. Um, and uh, the other work was the work of um, Trevor Nichols, who was a contemporary um, uh, trained artist working out of Adelaide with his machine time, dream time, uh, spiritual figures. These works were really celebrated. Um, it, it's interesting that when I was also doing some research into this, I found that um, in terms of the artist's fees, <coughs> out of all of the Biennales, Rover and Trevor got the least. I think they got a $600 um, total per day, which is just appalling when we think about how we actually represent these artists who are at the height of their careers um, and, of course, have been collected in national collections all over the world. Jenny Watson followed up in um, 1993. There was a, um, a one-year gap um, because they wanted to align um, the Biennale to align with uh, 1995 to get a centenary because we'd moved one year out during the um, Second World War. Jenny Watson's work was probably the most um, curatorially challenging work because she actually really thought about museology. You can see that the works were hung um, outside the normal traditions and of course the work and the um, sort of the plaque next to it were the works as well. So it was a very interesting work. This was called um, Veils and False Tales. Um, Robert Hughes, in his uh, inimitable style, um, talked about her work as being um, eligible for a new prize. In Venice, there is a thing called the Golden Lion, and that's the work that the best, best piece of work in the exhibition is given. Robert Hughes coined a new prize called the, the Lean Ass, and he was going to award this to poor old um, Jenny, um, who, yeah, is still smarting about that work. Very interesting works, though. And, of course, a very strong feminist statement. So we just had indigenous work and then we had feminist work coming through. Bill Henson in 95, um, absolute showstopper, celebrated. Australia really is starting to make a mark in this exhibition. Um, 97, Fluent, um, a truly curated show by Hedy Perkins and Bronwyn Croft, Bronwyn Croft, two great Indigenous curators, created an absolute storm with the work of um, Emily Nawari, whose work has become so important in terms of contemporary art. Here was this 90-year-old woman who had, had painted in the last 10 years of her life and captured so much of her tradition in these evocative works that um, really was celebrations in the Biennale. 
Um, Yvonne Kilmaitri, uh, the basket weaver from, um, from Berry, uh, who, who reinvested the great Nurunji um, tribal weaving of, um, of um, sedge grass and created these beautiful eel tracks. And Judy Watson, who's continued to be a, a significant player in contemporary art, uh, had a series of works and a performance by um, uh, Stephen Page from Mangara was also presented there. 99 was Howard Arkley, his last major exhibition before he OD'd when he got back. Uh, and again, Australia was just celebrated with this kind of retro um, production with these wonderful um, stencil-based works, which really harked back onto a, an, an old tradition. Our first real effort to look at um, installation video works with Lyndall Jones, Deepwater Aqua Profunda, I think perhaps one of the most poetic works that we've, we've held in Venice. Um, this was a small... Uh, I mean, I remember interviewing Lyndall and she said, you know, this is a plasma screen, Stephen, and it's $6,000, you know. A plasma screen back in, back in 2001 was gold, and it was only that big sort of thing. Um, and of course she had um, uh, multiple projections. And of course this is when, you know, data projectors were still very expensive and artists were only just getting to play around with this technology. This was beautiful because it... Um, it was actually lots of images, video images of water taken out of a Vaporetto and also out of a Sydney ferry. <coughs> so she was trying to bring Sydney and Venice together. And what happened is she'd have this water washing over the three screens and eventually there would be an alignment coming up to a, um, a pier. And of course there would be these lines of the, the horizon moving. And all of a sudden there'd be this beautiful alignment and you just felt, ah. Oh. And it was just the sort of really poetic, toned down uh, contemporary artwork. I, I really praised this work in a review, and um, a couple of people said, Oh, you're far too generous. And I said, Well, did you actually look at the work? Did you spend any time with this? No, you just passed on. So, um, and I think that's the thing that you need to immerse yourself in these works and really try and get something out of them. Um, Piccinini's work was a, a huge shock over there, too. People loved it. Um, she, in terms of being an entrepreneurial artist, is a, is a great example. I mean, uh, doesn't produce any of this work herself, it's all the ideas um, and uh, use of uh, Sam Jinks to produce those works, but, but an absolute innovator in terms of the sort of work that she's done. Antithesis, I mean, this is the clever thing about the way the Australian Council has made its selections. You have this really high-end work about um, sort of biotech issues uh, in Piccinini's work. And then you have this beautiful reversal to a whittler. Um, Ricky Swallow's whittled pieces of, um, of, of sculpture, of, of fish, um, uh, you know, iconic objects. Um, creating tableaus that, that hark back to um, you know, the 19th century. I mean, just this beautiful play off these objects. And, they were just singing, you know, to be photographed and to, to experience them in the round and know that this had all been carved by this one young man. Um, beautiful stuff. The other thing that the Australian Council did at this time too was it started to have satellite exhibitions that weren't in the pavilion. So Susan Norrie uh, had a video installation. Um, Daniel von Sturmer had a video installation in the, in the um, pavilion. Uh, Callum Morton, the architect, created a, 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 a three-quarter scale of his, his home that his father produced for Valhalla. Um, then again, we move into 2009 with Sean Gladwell, who'd done beautiful work in the previous Biennale and uh, was given the whole pavilion, um, playing around with his kind of Mad Max images, his Madimus Maximus show which again tried to play off that poetic and, and tap into the Australian zeitgeist. And a lot of people really identified with it. Um, and again, we also started to work in these satellite shows with a really hard work by Vernon Arkea, who um, 
I guess, inverted language and indigeneity um, to kind of create another version of identity in Australia, um, which was a very strong work. Um, Healy and Correo uh, created an installation made out of, I don't know how many thousand VHS cassettes, but the thing was that if you actually played all of these video cassettes, it would add up to the duration of the average person in the world's life. And I thought it was a really interesting way of tapping into something that we all identified with and then recasting it in a new sense. And Kenyon Atani's beautiful sugar sculptures, um, which were actually products of his work here at JCU or when he was working at Ames. Um, so these are um, uh, pieces from the Great Barrier Reef and um, all made of sugar, um, which will uh, fabricate beautiful works again. But you'll notice too that we're now starting to use our um, uh, immigrant artists who are representing Australia because we start to identify that Australia is a land of many people. And most recent one, 2011's Hany Amanius' work, incredibly conceptual work, uh, a lot of people really struggle with it because it's all about the sense of artifice and the kind of inversion of what you think you're seeing and what you're really seeing. Um, for instance, this, uh, this angle is made of styrene foam, but it's actually not made of styrene foam. It's actually cast in bronze and repainted to look like styrene foam. Um, so it, it, it kind of is this play on things. So we've got this stuff that looks like it's come out of the dump master, old chipboard tables with chrome legs, all cast out of bronze and then faked to look like what it was originally. So again, you sort of, I mean, you come up to it, you know, why would you do it? You know, so you, it kind of pushes you into another way of looking at things. Um, and, it really, and people really struggle with it. Now, I was just going to quickly say that Singapore also um, has a history of the Venice Biennale, but it's only got a 10-year history. And um, because Singapore is coming up to celebrate its 50th anniversary, in 2015, they're not exhibiting this year, um, which is a great tragedy, and a lot of contemporary artists in Singapore are very uh, concerned with the government. But in Singapore, the government is very strong uh, and controls things. Um, they invest a lot of money in the arts, but not in this particular contemporary area. But um, we get some wonderful sense of how faithful the Singaporeans, the, um, the No Merlin is a great, um, concept work for 2015. If you've ever been to Singapore, um, our iconic statue is the Merlion, because of course the lion um, is um, the, uh, the symbol for Singapore, um, and the fish, because of course Singapore is a fishing village. And the idea was to take this 80 tonne sculpture that is iconic in Singapore and transpose it into Venice for the duration. But of course it was never going to happen, but it was to think about why Singapore would do something like that. So it's very nice contemporary work. Um, these works by um, Vincent Leo, um, fabulous pieces that we probably have seen in many art journals. Um, the, the Ming Wong work was all about the history of cinema in Singapore. And this was a beautiful exhibition that um, really tapped into that. And of course, 2011, the Hong Zhu Nguyen, the the cloud of unknowing. Um, for those of you who actually got to Venice and were in this um, space where they pumped fog into the room, and then you watched these very tall buildings, these HDB towers, where most Singaporeans live, and it created this kind of other world, um, which represented it. And we were all, I think, so disappointed that we couldn't see Singapore work in this um, Biennale. So ultimately what I'm suggesting is that yes, we can look at all of this art as art. And I could give you an art history lecture about where it all fits in. We could um, talk about technique and you know how drawing has gone to hell in a handbasket and artists can't draw and there's no technique and why does Patricia Piccinini not make her own work? And we could have all of those discussions. But we could also start to look at it as a way of seeing who we are as Australians, what our political regimes are telling us about how they see us, who they will let go to Singapore, who they won't let go to Singapore, 
Who actually gets into the BNO? Who gets into the shortlist of the BNO? It gives us all of these types of ways of seeing things. And as I've gone around so many Biennales, I get a sense of how other nations are looking at their work, whether there's a sense of insecurity, whether there's a sense of opulence. Um, I, I know that looking at the, um, the American pavilion is often a great sort of touchstone to sort of see how things are going. You know, at the height of the GFC, they had an inverted tank, a, um, a you know, a, a an army tank, upside down, where they had somebody running on a treadmill that drove the tracks on this tank. You saw what a banal kind of exhibition to talk at the height of, um, of a kind of a global depression that's about to hit. So it does give us this, this other filter. Um, we've got so many statistics now about using a kind of art metrics uh, to measure how successful economies are going, you know, the art index. And uh, this is a fascinating other side of, of economics. Um, the other thing is to think about art as a composite indicator. Um, it, it does allow us to put a number of um, quite disparate pieces of data together to actually look at things from a new perspective. And uh, I do think there's a lot of room for um, theorists in the arts um, to actually to recast where the arts actually fit uh, in terms of the future. As I said, I think Australia is now stepping up to the mark. We have cemented our um, place by having a pavilion, which was a temporary pavilion, but now we're actually going to have um, our own pavilion. Uh, it's, it's going to be the white cube, which is the traditional viewing space in, in modernity, inside the black exterior cube. Um, so there's a real play on words um, that, that's going to be part of um, Deaton Court and Marshall's work, which I think will be very exciting to see. And apparently um, they've got the $6 million largely through philanthropy, which now also aligns us with much of the rest of the world, that it's not just functional budgeting system, but actually it engages with real people, people who have a love of the arts, people who have a love of the sciences, people who have a love of, of the economy, uh, and people are now starting to see the arts as being, you know, an integrated part of who we are, not as a kind of extraneous thing that elite um, people engage with. Um, so for 2013, Simran Gill uh, is actually going to be um, representing Australia. And the great thing is that Simran was actually born in Singapore, so I sort of feel a bit of Singapore is, is going to be presented there. Um, Simran's got a great tradition of work. She's exhibited in um, many international exhibitions, including Documenta, um, and I think that she'll, um, she'll certainly create a, a great show there in Venice this year. I suppose this just brings me back to the start of why I was so interested in art as a kid. Um, a different lens. I've always perhaps felt a little bit on the margins, not seeing things the way everybody else does. Um, but I guess what it's about is seeing something and then articulating it. Um, Peter and myself were having a, a quiet glass of wine over dinner a, a week or two ago and we were saying how important it is for artists to stop making art and to actually start talking about it and even better still writing about it, because there is a sense of um, cognitive process that actually happens when you can articulate what it is that you're doing. When you look back on a body of work, when you put up a show and you think, yeah, there's, there's 12 months or there's 18 months of work um, that you actually can see in context. I think about Jenny Hopp's work. I, I saw her show a couple of weeks ago and I thought, yeah, this is a great opportunity to actually sit back and look that you know a whole lot of images about Townsville and you know, outside of Townsville and about painting and about a whole lot of those sorts of things. Um, the paintings do, do great work. Some people can buy the paintings, they can look at the paintings and stuff, but what is it that we think? And uh, you know, I know that Jenny's um, you know, interested in research. Um, one of the things that I think artists can do is find a way of articulating what it is that they're contributing 
to our future. Um, the whole notion of creating new knowledge, uh, and that new knowledge is of course always within us. I mean, we take the time, we spend the time in the studio, we put the work together, but often it can't go any further than just to be purchased by somebody and to have that conversation. So I would really urge those of you that, that, that feel up to it to actually start to articulate and to also do that collaboratively with your friends, you know, to actually put down some words, write a page about somebody else's show, get it into a journal. I mean, you know, Jeanette actually, you know, with the, um, the art days that we used to have, you know, had an opportunity where people could put out those things. I know you can blog it, you can do all sorts of things, but... Send it to art days. Send it to art days. You know, these are the sorts of things that will get us noticed. I mean, yeah, that... <laughs> um, the thing is that I think that we make things matter by presenting them and then articulating the stories that relate to them. We wouldn't have any idea about what was happening in the Renaissance unless Vasari wrote about it. You know, he was able to capture those stories. And that gives us that other window, that view from the outside in or the inside out. So, all I can say is I, th I think that there's great opportunities to use um, contemporary art as a way of repositioning our future, and not just in the arts, across the economy, across the political spectrum, um, because it does matter, and we can actually see how much we've grown as a nation by looking back at this work. So um, that was really the kind of final statement that I made in, in my thesis, um, is that when I started off, I was writing a history of the Venice Biennale. At the end of the process, I actually discovered something very new, that we, that we had a snapshot, a window into um, a 60-year history of Australia. Not just the arts, but a 60-year window into Australia. And as I said, I think that's when you, when you discover something like that, it, it, it's a great moment, it's that kind of unique moment. And, um, I think that's probably where we should probably be learning. So you might think we're going to go with that. Jim. Okay. I'm just curious, the banality is obviously the final event in terms of art, but in terms of Venice and the, the concept of driving all those all those other forms of art, theatre, cinema, music, dance. You don't see that in Australia. Do you think there's an opportunity for a community to take something like that up and fashion possibly a festival every couple of years around that whole concept? Yeah, look, I, I think that in a way Venice becomes the most pervasive arts festival city in the world. Um, Adelaide's also done it. I mean, I think Adelaide has that grand tradition too. But as I said at the start, it's, it's, a, it's a bit like Singapore. Venice has nothing. I mean, it's a floating city that's got absolutely nothing except the fact that it's been eclectic and it's sucked in the good from the people that are sailing by. And, in, and eventually what they were able to do is let's say, well, let's celebrate things that are really important, such as um, con contemporary art, or contemporary film, you know, with, with the, the great festival at the Lido, or whether it's the architecture biennale and those things. And what they've got is, is the opportunity to draw people in to such a great venue city. Um, we probably need to recognise the places where we do it, because I think the last decade and a half in Australia, everybody's wanted to get festival status, and certainly the Australia Council encouraged that, but maybe not every country town, every country city needs to have an art festival, which is a mirror of the other art festival. You know, we do one like Cairns, Cairns does one like Mildura, Mildura does one like, uh, you know, somebody else. I mean, we have to find what's distinct about us. Um, things like Australia Femme, I think, was a great, a great example of us really tapping into something. The Chamber Festival is a brilliant example. Yeah, you know, Charters, Towers, Country and Music, I mean, that's, that's a great festival, you know, I think what we've got to do is work out what it is that we do really, really well, and that's our point of difference, and then market like hell and get the whole community behind it so that we've got champions, because that's really how 
and then espionage started. That's how Castel Documenta started. You know, you need one person who's really, really passionate and able to galvanise it.